Hello and welcome to the Overland Journal Podcast. I am your host, Scott Brady, and I am here with a longtime friend, one of the most prolific overlanders on the planet, someone that so many of us look up to, Graham Bell. Thank you so much for being on the podcast today, Graham. Thanks for having me, Scott. Good to be back. And special thanks to GTF Overland for supporting this week's podcast. GTF Overland was founded on the belief that everyone should be able to get to the outside. Whether you're a retiree roaming the earth having an existential crisis or a young single mother looking to give your kids new experiences outdoors or somewhere in between. Serving dealers and adventurers since 2017. You can visit GTF Overland in Long Beach, California, as well as online at gtfoverland.com. Thanks again, GTFO. Interview. The first time that we talked, uh, we were trying to get together in South Africa when the pandemic hit, and you were stuck in one part of Africa and I was stuck in the other. So we actually ended up doing the first interview on Zoom. It was the first time we'd ever done that. And uh, that was episode number 17 for those who'd like to go back in time a little bit. Uh, but there has been a whole lot of living that you and your family have done since then. Uh, you've gotten a lot more involved with Overland Journal and Expedition Portal. So for those that are listening, if you want to find out more about what Graham and his family are up to, um, check that out on on the portal and in Overland Journal. So where is your family at? Now, you're here in Prescott, but where is your family at? Uh, when you flew out? They're uh, enjoying the sunshine in Guadalajara. <laughs> uh, enjoying the space without me to you know, <laughs> uh, use up resources. So when, when you leave, because you guys spend every day, just about 24 hours a day together. We've talked a little bit about how you guys find your moments of space and stillness and that kind of thing. But how does it feel for you to leave them on a plane and to go away? You know, I kind of go in on business trip. And then how does it feel for them? Have they shared with you what they're up to and how that dynamic changes when, when dad's gone? I, we were talking about it since the last time that we were apart for more than a couple of days. And it was years ago. Yeah. Um, literally years ago. So yeah. it's, it's very strange. Yeah. Because we're such a tight unit. We spend yeah. every single day together in a camper, yeah. a campsite, in a, on the beach, in the mountains, whatever, but always within sight. Usually. So it, it was weird. Um, and I'm used to Louisa doing all the bureau- bureaucratic stuff for me. So <laughs> I, I, I to, you got to try to manage yourself. <laughs> right. I had to do yeah, my I'm own terrible at that. I'm terrible at that. Yeah. I'm constantly failing at my own self-management. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I was, I'm used to her doing all that kind of stuff. So it was good for me to realize I can actually um, get on a plane without <laughs> screwing it up. Did, uh, she, did she have you, you know, like you had your minder and she's like, no, call me when you land. And, yeah. and you have a little sign waiting for you. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like that, but she'd like step yeah. by step. Now, this is what happens when you get to the airport. Now, this is what you happens when you check in. And, and so, yeah, she's very good at that. She's, uh, she's wonderful. a mama bear. Yeah, she is. It's, it's incredible. And yeah. she was interviewed on the podcast by Ashley, and that, that was one of, well, it is my favorite episode that we've ever done. I, I found, well, I'd never had the chance to just, like a regular listener, turn on my, you know, iPhone, and here's a new episode from the Overland Journal podcast. I, I, I didn't hear it in when it was first done, and I never audited the episode. I didn't listen to it. Um, so I got to just turn it on and listen to it while I was driving to the sailboat. And I just found myself laughing out loud and thoroughly enjoying. Um, so we need more more Ashley and more Louisa and less me, I think. So those those two were so wonderful together. Yeah. And I was here, but you locked me out. Oh, that's right. That's right. That was the rule. That was the rule. You weren't, you weren't allowed to be around. I remember that. Neither of us were. We were, right. we were banished. Banished. Deservedly yeah. so, yeah. So, well, that's, you know, it's interesting because there are so few parents in the modern world, and if you think about it in, in a first world country, that have the opportunity to be with their family that much. And you're one of the few that are able to do that. Um, how has that, in your mind, changed the course of your life? I mean, when you look back on, because your kids are getting close to being adults. I mean, Helen's already an adult. Um, and your daughter, how old's your daughter? Uh, 
Uh, <clears throat> 18 in September. Okay, so you have two adults now, and you've had 18 years of just about every single day with them. How, right. when you look back, what do you what do you feel about that? What what comes to mind? What what comes to your heart after spending all that time with your kids? I want more. Yeah. You know, it's, you don't uh, want to let them go. <laughs> yeah, and uh, the early days when we were on the road, it was it was a lot of hardcore travel. Yeah, it was it was tough days, tough yeah. nights, tough roads, tough locations. Yeah, um, and it was tough for them. And what we did as much as we could to mitigate that to make them comfortable, and sure. that's a very bit important part of it. And you guys were living in a roof tent at the time, right? For four years, the first four years was yeah. in a roof tent, um, but it became a nest. Mm. You know. It, I mean, it is already a nest, but it became like this really homely little place. And then it was, um, you know, the mornings were filled with laughter and sure, uh, it, it, we just got into a routine and we just click. We just know each other. We know each other's buttons. We know what not to do. Uh, and that's impo- more important than knowing what to do, I think. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I look back on it and I think, man, I wish I'd spent more time with them doing this or doing that. I mean, yeah. every parent has regrets. I suspect, yeah. Yeah, when they look back and go, um, but at least... I mean, sometimes I just sit and smile because my regrets are, I can't say I wish I spent more time with them. (laughs) Because you did, yeah. It's not possible. Mm. (laughs) It's simply not possible. Um, And I'm very proud of who they become as as people. Oh, they're fantastic. Yeah, Yeah, they're fantastic. That's awesome. They really are. I mean, just to watch them in the booth last year and interacting with the public and Keelan, he's just so excited to, to talk with people and to share his story and, yeah, he's just this gentle giant. That's so, what he is. That's yeah, which is, is beautiful. I mean, that's yeah. all you could ask for for your kids is that they turn out okay. Right, <laughs> right. and he's better than okay. Than yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. yeah, that's exceptional. So they're in Guadalajara, and um, I know that you're going to have a hard time talking about this, but you're not driving a Land Rover right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I'm not. And it's... Uh, I don't know how to feel about it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, I mean, you're. I mean, I noticed that there's no grease under your fingernails. Um, you seem so much more relaxed. You have more, you have more disposable income. <laughs> right. I'm more, more time to think about other yeah. things. Of course, we're joking. I mean, Land Rovers are absolutely wonderful. And you, Graham and I are going to spend some time on a podcast about Defenders soon, but. I guess the question for me is you made several rapid changes to your situation with the truck. So you were, you went from living in a roof tent on top of the vehicle to building a camper just a few years ago. Um, and then, well, 2018, was it when you built the uh, camper? 2017. 17. Early, yeah. Okay. So 2017, you built a camper for the defender and now you're in a full size truck with a camper. Yeah. Talk a little bit about uh, what has been the upsides of those changes and then what's been the compromises that you've encountered. Oh, in between the two, we had an old Range Rover. That's right. Well, yeah, yeah we can talk about that too because it's kind of bringing you guys back to old school. Yeah, so that was that was great because um, we got to see that. I mean, the differences are, are vast between a Range Rover with a little roof tent and an awning with walls and sleeping on the ground. Sure. In a swamp in Georgia with <laughs> skunks on your lap. And, <laughs> sorry, I love you, Georgia. <laughs> no, um, of course, beautiful place. Yeah, wonderful, but... Um, it it was it was awesome to go from that into the nimble yeah. with the remote control hydraulic lift roof and the packing space and the storage and the sure. aircon that works and the reliable Cummins engine and the it's just uh, I'm I'm struggling to find downsides to it yeah I'm struggling and I think we're so many of us are encountering that I had never owned a full size truck and then I went right into a you know, turbo diesel, full size GMC. And by about three months in, I thought, well, now I understand why so many millions of people own these things. Right. Because they're, other than trying to find a parking spot, which has been something that I recognize as a compromise and probably some of the more technical trails. But the majority of the trails that I've done, I'm surprised. I'm impressed that it, it's just going to do it just fine. Uh, but the, the overall comfort and capability of these full-size trucks is impressive. It is, and the long wheelbase um, is actually, it, 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 it can be advantageous. Mm-hmm. I remember uh, Kingsley Holgate, the famous South African explorer, many sure. people, he, he deserves a lot more recognition in the States than what he has in around the world, I suppose. But he's the, he's the man that's been around, more, around Africa more than anyone. And of the three 
defenders, the 90, the 110 and the 130, the 130 he said was his favorite because it was the most capable for mm. our type of overlanding. For sure. You know, when you're doing trails and, and stuff like that, it's you want to have a shorter wheelbase and et cetera. But um, the longer wheelbase, it, 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 it reads the track differently mm. when you're uh, in mud and, and uh, et cetera. The, the wheelbase, it's, it's longer, it grabs further, it gives For you sure. more. Especially climbing, descending, right. much more stable. Right, it gives you a bit of stretch. And then, so you've got, I reckon the, the vehicle that we've got now, so it's a, it's a 2500, it's the number on the 2500 uh, Dodge Ram 2006 with the Cummins engine. Um, I could pretty much take that, Ninety percent of the places I went with the, around the world with the Defender, I mm -hmm. wouldn't do the seven hundred kilometers on the beach in Brazil mm -hmm. that we did, uh, simply because it's uh, it's a different creature, and um, I, I gained a lot of confidence with it with sand driving, which I thought would be its nemesis. Sure, uh, in Baja, and I was pleasantly surprised. Yeah, maybe the, just air the tires down a bit more. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I tested it without even airing down. Oh wow! Impressive. In the beginning, I was like, okay, if I'm going to get stuck, I've got a couple of max tracks. Sure. Um, let's see what happens. And it's got so much power. It's got so much torque. And it's, it's, uh, I've got front and rear lockers. Oh, wow. As well. That's a new thing for you. Yeah. Because yeah. you, you don't have that on the Defender, uh, do you? It's the yeah. center. And, and yeah. great driving it, skill. Mag, magic magic button. Right. The locker button. Right. Yeah, yeah with that and your, your broad skills as a driver. Right. Yeah, I'm petrified of getting stuck. <laughs> I hate it. You, I think I, I know why, because my wife gets really testy. When uh, <laughs> no, that makes sense. So there's other consequences right. to right. just being stuck. Right. For me, I used to always feel embarrassed when I got stuck. Like I'm not supposed to. I, I work so hard at my craft and it's my job and I should never get stuck. And I realized that that was such a foolish approach. Um, that the more we get stuck, the more we're learning, the more we're pushing the vehicle and we're more, we're understanding how to be proficient at recovery. So now I, I've, I've learned to embrace it, <clears throat> but I can see why there might be other consequences because the other people in the vehicle are realizing like we're stuck, the, the tide is rising, mm. right. <laughs> we're, you know, and then it, there's, it feels like the consequences are much higher. Right. And we always travel solo. Yeah, so sure. When we were traveling, when we crossed the Amazon, uh, I would be very careful to take my time, assess the situation, sure. adjust my driving style accordingly, even be patient and wait for someone else to come along and see what they did wrong. Right. 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 Um, and I never got stuck. Yeah. I mean, that the Land Rover was so full of mud, you couldn't <laughs> see out the window. Did you do the B29 road? Is no. We crossed, we crossed uh, from um, Belo Horizonte. Okay. No, no, I'm lying. I'm lying. Balvista. Okay. Uh, when you come down through Venezuela, okay, drop down and then you go Balvista, Balvista. We went through the top of the Amazon to um, from Linden to Lethem to okay. uh, British Guiana. That's a very remote area, right? Right, where it has carnivorous uh, butterflies. <laughs> that kind of gets you worried when the when the cute things are eating flesh. <laughs> I'm not going to make a mistake here. <laughs> uh, and then we went through um, the, from. French Guiana into Brazil and then down to Macapá again through the jungle. And then we were on the uh, Amazon River for three days. Incredible. Right. On a ferry with a vehicle? Right, on the ferry. Wow. Yeah, that was cool. Uh, that, what an in incredible experience that would be. Right. So what are you – you're not really finding much downsides then with a full oh, size. Oh, yeah. Um, well, <laughs> I think I'm, the biggest problem, is, is, as always, is me, mm. right? So you guys grew up with um, full-size vehicles. Sure. Right. So it's a new thing to drive. Right. I'm not used to that width. Yeah. Right. And the length. Let's say, for instance, in uh, Mexico, Baja, where you've got those skinny roads. Yeah. Mex one is very narrow. Right. With a two inch shoulder. <laughs> sure. If you're lucky. And a, and a six foot drop off. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and trucks coming the other way. Yeah. Yeah. That's terrifying. And yeah, I, I have to get used to the width. Mm. And I'm always watching my right hand mirror and just seeing where that line is in relation to the tires. Sure. Um, but it's, it's been a while now and I'm getting used to it I'm getting, and I'm getting better at it. The other uh, drawback would be um, Mulahey, for instance. You know, sure, small tiny, town. Tiny you know, little roads and sure. trying to figure your way around there without causing, uh, giving someone a reason to give you a nice big chair like bull for something. <laughs> you know, yeah, sure. Getting a car or a wall. Um, but then you get to the other, you go through like Mulahey and you get to the other side and here's some guy with a freaking class A. Yeah. Or a you know fifth wheel, you know. True. And there's only one way. And how did he do that? And yeah. I'm stressing about this little nimble. Right. Like, oh well. 
Um, and that really has been the limitation. It surprised me how effective it is off road on the trails, yeah, um, on the beach. Um, I'm yeah, I'm struggling to find. I, and the fuel consumption is great. Is it similar to the Defender? In fuel consumption, yeah. yeah. When I put the big fat box on the back of the Defender, I, did, I used sure. to get twenty odd mpg, and I went down to sixteen. Yeah, sure. Uh, and the engine's getting older. The motor's getting older. But the um, the nimble, I get an average of about fifteen mpg. That's running the Acon. Yeah, sure. Uh, so it, I'm getting all of this power. I'm getting all of this space. I'm getting all this uh, touch wood reliability. <laughs> sure. Um, Is that why you have a wood bracelet on? Yeah. You? you can constantly. You you are a Land Rover owner. You can just constantly right. be uh, touching wood there. Yeah, I'll, t- I'll tell you the story. <laughs> I'll tell you the story quick. Um, I'm not superstitious about much, but. <laughs> When it comes to the Land Rover, I don't mind being a little bit superstitious <laughs> if it helps. <laughs> Whatever you can do, sure. Right. And uh, I used to actually for years carry a little piece of wood. Ah. Uh-huh. It was ridiculous. I would transfer it from my trousers to trouser. And I okay. always, you know, people say, how's the Land Rover? I'll give it a rub. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> and we we're in um, Argentina and the kids found a, a broken wooden necklace and then they made it into a bangle for me and said, well, now you don't, you don't have to keep the, the piece of wood in your pocket. <laughs> Um, and that's just become kind of our trademark. Uh, I like it. Yeah, because it's all about, how's the Land Rover? Oh, it's good, <laughs> rub, rub, rub. Well, and if I remember correctly, you went for the vast majority of your travels in the 130 were, were fairly problem-free. And, and I've heard that for the TD5 was that it was, you know, very reliable, very, all things considered. Very reliable. You know, um, the purists, um, they hated the, the ECU. Mm. And... I still, I, I don't get that anymore. Mm. And I think just people like us doing the travels we have with the TD5, it really proves for a lot of a lot, a lot of naysayers what sure. they're actually capable of. The problems I had were wheel bearings, mm. uh, tires, um, oil cooler that went. Um, Usually the steering system gives some trouble. No, nothing. Oh, no leaks or anything. No, but I'm, one of the tricks I learned, never turn your wheels when you're stationary. Ah, okay. Never rest your foot on the clutch. Um, never rest your hand on the gear lever. There's a bunch of these little habits that you can do, which over time um, help to preserve these these systems. So that like makes sense. steering, you're putting almost so much pressure on if you're standing still and turning the wheels. Sure. Unless you're on dirt or yeah. whatever. But yeah, no, the steering hasn't been bad. And I'm I'm really good at just because I'm paranoid of breaking down. Mm. Um, I, I I try and maintain her as well as possible, and and I and my butt knows every little <laughs> shake and bump and wiggle sure. know, yeah that no that's a wheel bearing or no that's a steering damper or well, that's a tire that's a bit flat or yeah so, sure uh but now we maintain it really well and we, where is the where is the defender now she's uh in cape town there's a campsite there that also does storage yep um and she's in a container and the beauty of that is if i decide i want her anywhere in the world i literally send the guy an email give him a bunch of cash yeah and then wait two months and uh, there she'll be. Sure. Already loaded. Yeah. Uh, with all my personal effects in there, everything. So that's that's really convenient for us. It's really nice to have that. Because you were originally planning on driving up Africa. In fact, the timing when we were going to meet um, to do the podcast the first time, we were both going to be driving north. I was going to go to Kenya as far as Kenya, and you were planning on going all the way and ultimately all the way to Vladivostok. But the pandemic shut all of those borders down fairly quickly. That was right. shocking to see how quickly that happened. And then now the situations in the world with the war in Ukraine, Russia is certainly off the table for most people. I mean, maybe they wouldn't look too sideways at a South African passport, but yeah, they wouldn't. Yeah. I'm pretty sure we could still go through yeah. if borders are open. Look, the thing we would, so when, when you're in South Africa and we were there, we, there was a lockdown in South Africa. Correct, yeah. Um, and we were taking the pandemic seriously. We self-isolated. Um, and we were very careful. But we still wanted to travel. Yeah. So as soon as we saw the borders were opening up, we hit the road. And during uh, the pandemic, we went uh, to we went through Mozambique. Um, How was that? It was hot. Uh, and we had to jump through all these hoops because of the COVID tests. Sure. So we couldn't just drive up to Tet and then go over to Zambia or Malawi. We had to first do this main uh, jungle route um, up and around and down to, I think not, I think it was Beira, um, where we could get a COVID test. And then we had to shoot up 
to Tet, and if you know Mozambique, unless sure. you do, there's no such thing as shooting sure, across yeah. anywhere. Right? Yeah, sure. Um, and the roads were just horrendous. It was beautiful. It was wonderful. We loved it. And uh, got to Tet, and then we had so many problems at the border getting into Zambia. There, uh, The corruption just went off the hook. Mm. Um, and then we got as they, and, had few, they had fewer prey. Right, right, exactly. There we, just we, wasn't people at the border. Right. And so uh, we tried to get into Malawi. And they tried to charge us five hundred dollars little fee, and so we turned around and left. And the the helpers were running. They were the runners. Yeah, sure. They were running after the Land Rover, hitting it. They were so pissed that we didn't pay the fee. Sure. Um, so, but we were very serious about the pandemic. We self isolated all the time. We were very very careful. None of us got COVID, um, yeah, and we certainly weren't spreading it. Um, and we went up to Zambia, then got to the Tanzanian border, and it it, it was apparent that Ethiopia was not going to open up anytime soon. Um, the the route around uh, South Sudan wasn't an option for us. Right. Uh, Djibouti wasn't an option. Kenya to Saudi Arabia was an option because we have now have a dog and we have right-hand drive. So we sure. Thought, yeah. Yeah, because you can't get into Saudi Arabia with a right-hand drive. Right. Or a dog. Oh, I didn't but the know people, it. People I didn't can know do that. it. People do it. Yeah. But the law specifically states you can't do it. Okay. And we would think, well, you've got to know somebody that has that can help facilitate, yeah. Possibly, or just be lucky at the border. Yeah, sure. I think the uh, Saudis have really opened up. You guys have got a lot of content coming out we do. about Saudi, which is fascinating. Yeah, but we had to weigh it up and say, is this something that we're willing to commit to to really try and get through there, and then what? Get yeah. stuck in Jordan, or how do we cross Lebanon and Syria? Yeah, um, other ferries running to Cyprus and then to Turkey, and it was just a logistical nightmare. Yeah. So we ended up going to Namibia, like anyone needs an excuse to go to Namibia, right? Yeah, it's one of the most special places on the planet. Absolutely. Love In fact, it. it's one of my favorites, and I think about the places that are my favorites. So you've got Namibia, and then you've got southern Utah, and they're, and they're so, I mean, it's the red, maybe it's something about the red deserts that I just... <laughs> that I just really love. In fact, it's funny. Um, I don't remember the guy's name, but he came up to me at Overland Expo and he says, you know, the one place that you talk about in every podcast, except for these, he could actually li list the podcast that I didn't mention it was Ushuaia. So that I'm going to say Ushuaia on this podcast just for him <laughs> because it's been, so yeah, that's funny though. It's funny how we, we mentioned the same things over and over again, but Namibia is really special. Yeah. Your mind just keeps going back to it. I mean, and the beauty of and the difference between Namibia and Utah is that you have the Himba people and you have wild lions and wild elephants. And yeah. you have those massive expanses where you could have the greatest adventure or misadventure. Um, but at the same time, in a couple of days, you could be in a game lodge sipping an ice cold Vintuk, having yes. a braai, watching the elephants at the waterhole. So it, I really encourage people um, who are nervous about international overlanding. Um, I do it a lot. And I, and yeah. I know I wrote an article for uh, Overland Journal. Where I um, and again encourage people, fly and drive. And if you want a fly and drive um, option, which is simply superior to anything else that I know of, Namibia is the place to go. They've got the vehicles, they've um, kitted Land Cruisers, yeah, um, and it feels so safe there. And it's very open. A lot of wild camping as well. Yeah, and you can have a basic experience or yeah. a safe experience. You can join guides, um, or you can have you know, exhilarating, adrenaline-pumping experiences. Yeah, for sure. Um, and very close to each other. And the Skeleton Coast. and Right, and the Caprivi Strip. Incredible, and, truly. Uh, Botswana's right there. Um, so I, I encourage people a lot. Uh, when I hear people say, oh, I'd love to, but my wife or... Uh, I'm yeah, like, yeah. Well, hey, this is the kind of place where you can take your wife and she can have a great time in a luxury lodge. Yeah. And then you say, hey, you know, let's go do this. And, yep. And, and, and get into it and get that feeling for mm -hmm. it and, and get that passion for mm -hmm. it. It's really the kind of place to go and do that. So, yeah, so, uh, and that was my pitch for the Namibian Tourism Board. Uh, <laughs> she check is in the mail. Yeah, uh, no, doubt. no um, doubt. But it's it's so valid, though. It's right. so valid. And, and actually, the, the, the guy who came up to me at Over, Overland Expo, his name was Derek. So, Derek, thanks for, for right. stopping by and saying hi. Right. But I, would, I agree about Namibia. Yeah, really, really an amazing spot. Right. So... You decide not to do that. You bring the truck back to South Africa, and then you decide that you're going to come to the U.S. and head south again. Right. So we were kind of at, at odds of what to do with ourselves. My problem is that I get really itchy 
if I, even in a beautiful home, I, I give me a week mm. and I'm, I'm like climbing the walls. I'm, You're I, feral now. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, and for Luzu as well. And the kids, yeah. um, the kids, not so much. I mean, they enjoy all the luxuries of a home, but so we were staying in a place called Kleinmont, which is near Hermanus. Mm. Probably been there. It's absolutely beautiful. Yeah, I don't think I've been there. Oh, yeah, you, yeah you'll, you'll love it. It's uh, just west of uh, Cape Town. Okay. Right. Um, on the road to Neisner. Okay. Yeah, I know where you're at. It's yeah. a beautiful, beautiful part of the world. And we were talking to a friend of ours, uh, Chris Rutte, and uh, he is the Guinness World Record holder for the longest motor- motorcycle trip around the world. Wow. With his wife, Erin. You should get him on the podcast. That'd be great. Really interesting guy. Um, and we were chatting to him and yeah, Chris, we don't know what to do with ourselves. You know, do we just do Southern Africa again? Because everything was, you know, there was a lot of lockdown still happening internationally. And he was like, go to USA. Okay. We thought about it and like, well, hey, why not? Yeah. You know, we love the US. A hell of a lot of our friends are here. Uh, we love traveling here. And um, so the idea started fermenting. And uh, we... It was difficult to do any real planning because we didn't know if we'd actually make it here. But we found that there was a loophole or there was a way to do the way we could go to Mexico uh, with negative uh, PCR tests, self-quarantine in Mexico for two weeks, and then cross into the States. I see. Right. And then when we landed, because I didn't want to make any commitments. I didn't want to like, get anyone, uh, you know, put anyone out saying, yeah, we're going to be there. Can I borrow a vehicle? Yeah, sure. Oh, shit, we didn't make it. Whatever. Yeah, sure. Um, and that's how we landed up in that. Funky old Range Rover. <laughs> That's so great. Driving from uh, Florida to Maine in the summer and then across uh, to the, uh, the West Coast. And and how was that experience going back? Or, I mean, the smallest vehicle you've ever traveled in, actually. Yeah, it was um, it was interesting. So uh, what are the changes I made on the, the Defender when we got back to South Africa after the West Africa trip? Uh, was I, I added an awning, just a simple uh, straightforward awning with walls, which created a whole new living space. Sure. Which got me thinking, uh, you know, for a six-month trip, you don't need that much luxury. Sure. Uh, you really, I mean, and this is one of the problems I see is like people are too focused on the vehicles, mm-hmm. right? An old Range Rover with, uh, with a decent tent, off you go. Yeah. You know, what more do you need? Go so, see the world. Yeah, so uh, we spoke to a couple of friends of ours and, Organized some gear, a quick, quick pitch, organized us uh, a pop-top tent and a, and a awning. A snowmaster sent us a fridge and, and uh, oh, quick pitch also gave us some wolf boxes and that was it. Uh, we kitted the vehicle out in two days. Yeah, sure. Right? And off we went. And, and uh, looking back, we could have just got a big old ground tent from Walmart yeah. and said, all right, let's, let's do this. And off I, we go. Yeah. Uh, and it was fun. Um, eventually. Yeah. <laughs> once we got out of Florida. Sure. And once we, I think it really started like cooling down just uh, Atlanta, Georgia. We got up into the mountains out of there and I was like, oh, thank God. And it's, and those roads are beautiful there. Yeah. Yeah. But the, it was help getting there. I mean, because we were camping near the swamps. Yeah. Uh, Keelan and I were on um, cots on the ground. Um, and it was just stifling. Absolutely. Yeah. It was it difficult was, to sleep and. It was West Africa all over again. It was, uh, <laughs> sure. Yeah, I was getting in trouble with the kids. They were like, Dad, why are you doing this? And I was like, no, don't, don't worry, it'll be cool. We're going up to the mountains soon. Um, and then it really improved once we got up in the mountains. We had to do a lot of the work on the Range Rover because there were huge holes in the floor, rusted. And, sure. Uh, mechanically. Yeah, older few, vehicles, sure. Yeah, she had a few issues, but uh, we actually enjoyed doing that and just kind of nursing her along. And I, I fell in love with that. We called her Roach. <laughs> Roach. She was... She was, uh, she was gritty. Yeah, but she had, she had style, class. They do. Yeah, the Range Rovers, the classics are are incredible for that. They look great, and they're actually really nice to drive. Right. I remember I picked the one that I had up in in Houston from a friend of mine, Andy Biggs, and just drove it back stock, and it and did some trails with it, did did some sand dunes with it, and. And it you know, set the crew. It was just absolutely a pleasure to drive. Right. You could see why they were so you know advanced for their time. Right, right, and yeah. they're still beautiful. Yeah, and for they're sure. still desirable. Yeah, for sure. Um, we had a funny moment. We were driving on the on the on the freeway on the interstate in Michigan, and we, what we tried to do is go all the way from uh, Florida to Maine without going on the interstate. Mm. 
And we and I think in total we did a five thousand, six thousand mile trip and I think we maybe did two, three hundred miles of interstate across the whole US. Wow. So we really got it right. We went all these back roads and but there was the one time we're driving on the interstate and this woman pulls up in a GT um what's it, a GT forty, the old uh, the classic race um Oh sure. With the with the blue and the yeah, orange. Beautiful. Yeah. Right? The Ford, yeah. Right, yeah, yeah, the Ford. And she pulls up next to us and she gives me a peace sign and then she puts her foot down and the windows just <laughs> shake. And I'm like, yeah, I'm actually cool. I feel cool right now. Of all the people on the road, she stopped to say hello to us. And I put that on um, on, on Facebook or something. Sure. And everyone come back, came, was coming back like, oh, you're like on National Lampoon's holiday. <laughs> <laughs> American vacation. Right, there's that scene with the girl with the Ferrari or something. And that, that kind of burst my bubble. And, <laughs> uh, the, the car was a that's riot. That's funny. Yeah, the car was a riot. They had all these giraffes and elephants and that's this right. whole African decals going up that's and down right. the Which side. Which was perfect. <laughs> yeah. All it, things considered. Right. It, it, it just became a bit of a, a bit of a laugh. Uh, sure. I was like, let's just have fun with this. Yeah, for sure. You know? And we'd roll into t- uh, to campsites and people. And then we'd speak in our funny accents. <laughs> it just became a bit of a circus. But it was really good fun. That's great. Yeah. That's yeah, great. Yeah. And then how did you end up deciding on taking the nimble camper and the full-size truck. And special thanks to Equipped for supporting today's podcast. More than 15 years ago, Equipped Expedition Outfitters became the first American company to import the best in breed vehicle expedition equipment from across the globe. Since their humble beginnings, they have risen to become a go-to leader within the adventure travel industry, continuing to deliver a diverse portfolio of reliable, long-lasting products backed by unparalleled customer service. From shelter solutions from Easy On to portable fridges from National Luna to aluminum storage boxes from Alubox, their ever-growing selection of best-in-class gear increases your capability, comfort, and confidence during any adventure. Visit equippedone.com to gear up. Vehicle. Right. So I've been friends with the owner of Nimble for a while now, John Turner. Yeah. We met. Great guy. Of, yeah, he's a really good. A uh, very smart engineer, mm-hmm. yep. sharp, sharp, sharp. His whole team is very mm. sharp. And um, so I'd, I'd put it out there on social media in South Africa when we said, we're thinking of coming to uh, to America. We might need to borrow vehicles. Anyone got something? And he was one of the guys who came back and said, look, I've got this vehicle. Uh, we're going to be using it a little bit. When I'm finished with it, it's yours. You can use it as long as you want. And uh, you're not going to say no to that, right? No, I mean, because especially the comfort that comes with that camper. <laughs> right, yeah. right. And... Uh, so that's and when we dropped off the Range Rover, and then I went to John and picked up the Nimble, and I was, <laughs> I was like, you can imagine it was like going from a a, a kiddie's go kart to a spaceship. Yeah. Right. Well, you probably felt like you won the lottery. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Um, and it was the kids were so happy. Yeah. And sure. Lisa was so happy. It was just, uh, it was really comfortable and capable, and and. It was liberating. And is it a four door, like a full full size four door? Is it just the extended cab, or it's the extended cab? I okay. think what you call a quad cab. Or so. okay, it's quad it's cab. not the f- a crew cab. Okay, not the yeah. full rear um, okay. seats. It's but big enough it, for the girls. It is big enough. Okay. Yeah, but it was strange they actually went from the Range Rover with that huge back sure. seat made for executives and fat sure. politicians um, to yeah. the back, and they were complaining about that <laughs> a little bit. Um, but all the other stuff made up for it. Sure. And so we yeah, used having f- a shower and everything. Right. Like having a shower and aircon and, yeah. and, and the, the little lights that glow underneath and the roof that pops up. Sure. Um, uh, what was it? A 70 gallon water tank. Yeah. Luxurious. Gray water, everything. Yeah. You know, it was, it was a big change. And then, so we used the, the, the vehicle for a while. I'm trying to remember where we went cause we've been all over, but I think we went across down to Alabama Hills. Mm. That's gorgeous there. Right. And it was middle of winter. So we went, uh, it was snowing, and we went, went up to visit a friend in, um, near Boise, mm. and then headed up, um, up up north. We were looking, there was a lake up there we wanted to get to, and we landed up there. Coeur d'Alene, maybe? Probably, yeah. yeah. And we landed, the road was closed up ahead, so we saw the, uh, the sign saying road closed, so Louisa found a route around it. We went up into the mountains, and the sun set, and there was two feet of virgin snow on the ground, I'm South African. What do I know about snow? <laughs> right? Very, sure. very little. Um, and we landed up driving through that snow. Um, 
and and camping on we came out the other side of the mountain dropped down back onto the main road and it was exactly where they closed the road to go north to the lake we <laughs> thought we'd driven around the diversion <laughs> and we just drove to it for oh no so yeah then we, we had went, an adventure though right it was awesome i, I mean um it was the first time I'd used this vehicle in an off-road, uh, you know, um, s- environment, and it and it, it was spectacular. Mm. It didn't disappoint me at all. And you said it has a lockers, right? Your, I didn't use the lockers. Yeah, but I didn't even use the lockers. Yeah. What I, size tires on it? Back then, it had two seventy fives. Okay, eighteens. Um, sure. Yeah, so they weren't even big. It yeah, looked, looked absolutely silly on that vehicle. Sure, but and now you have some bigger tires on it, right? Yeah, so those were the general tire, the the all terrains, and they did very well mm. in the in the snow, sure. very very well. Uh, and anyway, so we, we came over and then we realized, well, we're not going anywhere. It's midnight, uh, and there was just a pull off on the side. We went and cabin to the snow, and um, ran the heater. And eventually we were getting hot. <laughs> yeah, because four people in the car, sure. Right. No, Keelan wasn't with us. He was somewhere oh, else at the it. time. But um, Louise was like, this is a game changer, right? <laughs> this is, what, we can camp like this and comfortably in the snow, in the cold. And yeah, so we, we really, we kind of started falling in love with the vehicle. And then I was, I was uh, chatting to John the one day, just on a messenger or whatever. And I was like, you know, I could drive this thing to Russia, you know? And he goes, well, why don't you? So... Well, it, yeah, okay, that's a new idea. And he was quite serious about it. And I think it's it's good for the company to see travelers like us sure. using that kind of vehicle. And it's good for the their potential clients and for sure. the audience to see. Uh, because especially for us going from something like the Defender to a vehicle like that and then still having the same kind of plans, ideas, routes, et cetera. Sure. So I think it's it's great for them and it's great for us. So it's a good It's a good idea, yeah. How far do you think you'll take it south? It's difficult to say at the moment. Because um, Mexico is a really nice place to spend time. <laughs> right. And when we came up to uh, the U.S. the first time in 2015, we kind of blasted through Central America because we were trying to get to the Overland Expo where I was going to launch my first book and become famous and, and incredibly wealthy and <laughs> overnight. Uh, and it would have happened if it didn't snow all weekend. <laughs> That's my excuse. It's not. Was that the snowmageddon? That, uh, that, oh, jeez. That was the Snowland Expo of 2015. <laughs> um, but we we really didn't give Central America enough time. Okay. Uh, so we definitely want to go visit there a bit more. And now we've got left-hand drive. Sure. It's no longer an issue. I can go sure. to Costa Rica. And we with the Defender. I couldn't go there anyway. Correct. Um, and then, we, so I'm talking to the Nimble and I'm seeing now, I know, like, what suits them. I mean, it's John's personal vehicle. Sure. It's his vehicle. I mean, he's yeah. got a, I think he's got another van he could use or whatever, but. Um, yeah, he's got a very cool uh, van, black van with a, like a U-joint off-road conversion, solid axle conversion yeah. on it. Yeah, very yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but it's it's not the Nimble. It's not, that's true. Right, in yeah, terms of true. comfort, et cetera. But he's, so the point is, is what works for them, what works for us. I mean, if you know anything about us is we, we kind of live on the fly. Sure. You know, we make decisions as, as opportunities arise or routes change or yeah. things happen. And then you make a plan. Right, and we make a plan. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it could be if they're happy and we, we have enough time with it, we can go down all the way down to South America. Sure. Um, and But because the vehicle is so great in the cold, I'd really like to do a bit of, you know, Canada, maybe Alaska in late winter. Smart. Yeah. Um, but to be confirmed. Yeah. I'll let you know when I know. I'll let you know when Louisa tells me what I'm doing with my life. <laughs> there's, a, there's an easy way to ship, just roll on, roll off, back from Panama. Right. Which is what I did after right. I got to the Darien Gap. I just shipped roll on, roll off. It was easy. Right and, to Houston. Yeah. And it's, and it's much cheaper than container these days. No question. And the Nimble, yeah. because the way it's designed, zzzp, yep. you close it. Close it up. They're not getting in there. They need yep. a, a Solzol. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, and, I mean, that's a game changer. That's right. Yeah, so now you're paying a third of the cost for shipping, and you can put all your stuff in there, and you don't have to worry about yep. being, being stolen. And and I couldn't lock up uh, the vehicle that I had, but nothing was touched. Right. I mean, the Panamanians, they were great. You were talking to Marty Mish yesterday. Yeah. And they said they also, they've, they've rode they a few times. Yeah, they had, had no problem. issue. Yeah. Right. I mean, it can't happen. For sure, you can find the random person that wants to rip you off. But I think that there's just a lot better controls and processes now. In fact, in fact, the the uh, the port in Houston felt like a third world country compared to the Panamanian one. The Panamanian one, they were professional and I mean, they showed up with the dogs and they were right. sniffing for drugs. I mean, they, and these guys were very professional. 
like not even the, a hint of any kind of impropriety. So, and that, but that's the core of their economy, down That's there. right. They take it very serious. Right. They can't afford a bad reputation. I would agree. Yeah. So that's a, something to consider. Mm, for you sure. Know, it'd be easy to roll on, roll off back yeah. to Houston, and then you're back in the U.S. and ripping and tearing. Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we love we love traveling in the states. Yeah. yeah and we really like now with the uh, with the, with the vehicle, with the nimble now, and it gives us a capability to travel in winter. Yeah. Which after West Africa and the Georgian swamps. Sure. Man, being cold is such a luxury. <laughs> it's a different thing. It is. It's. I love it. Yeah, I love it absolutely. It's. It's so comfortable. It's nice to travel in, and in so the new winter. for you guys. Right. Something so different. Right. I mean, you were lucky if Lesotho got the right amount of snow, and I, I did happen to get stuck in a snowstorm in Lesotho one time. But it doesn't always do that. I mean, I think right. that's one of the few ski areas in South Africa. But right. yeah. and, it, and it would be a very good training for us. Yeah. Uh, learning how to travel. I mean, you'd think after all the traveling done around the world. But in the beginning, we were chasing the sun. Sure. Right? And now we are getting to the point where we're saying, the sun's too hot. <laughs> right? Sure. Let's go. Let's change it up a little bit. So I think this will be very good for us to, to learn how to live, camp in the snow. Yeah. Um, snow is such a weird creature. You know, it, 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 it doesn't do what you think it's going to do. And you can make sure. fire on it, and it's great for peeing in. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about half the time, uh, but for is it say no, your inner dialogue is still the same thing we're all thinking. You're just saying it out loud, so we appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so um, Canada or and up to Alaska when it's still deep in snow, would it'll be, get you ready for Siberia, right, or Mongolia, right. or whatever. Sure, yeah. And once you've once you've you've taught yourself and you know your limitations, then that just opens up your opportunities no question yeah no right. question and and you could find and i mean there's a uh, kunin mariki from land cruising mm. um they took that old land cruiser of theirs incredible and they, yeah and they drove across uh, russia in the winter yeah they had to do some winterization yep and they have a great website by the way yeah karen and kun are amazing yeah, yeah, yeah land they, cruising adventures right right yeah and they've got and they're there's, there's two um overlanders uh or yeah overland couples whose website i use a lot. Uh, the one is uh, Karin and, and Kuhn. Yep. Oh, I, I wouldn't say I use it a lot, but if I do need information, that's where I go. If yep. I want to see winter driving through Russia, I'll go to theirs. Sure. Right? Um, and they're very, very good at uh, with their information. Their images are fantastic. Yeah. Um, and they give you what you need to know. Sure. So when I was thinking about traveling in winter, that's where I went and I was researching on their website. And the other one is uh, Michnes and um, also B. Ulefied from Picky Picky Overland. And yeah, you, they've been at it a long time. Right, and on bikes. And and so they, yeah, those two are a great resource. But anyway, so uh, I, I think it'll be a great opportunity for us if we do decide to go up there, is travel in, in, in the winter, and, and that'll give us the opportunity to learn how to travel in this place. Sure. Most people just turn around and run the other way. <laughs> sure. Right? And I think there's a, there's a lot of great opportunities in, in having a, a unique experience and it's something all new for you guys. Right. It's something totally new, a new environment, right. new places yeah. to explore Canada, which is just gorgeous. It's just gorgeous, truly. Right. And we haven't done really, we've crossed Canada up going up to Alaska. Sure. Um, but I mean, there's, that's a whole nation Yeah. that we've barely scratched the surface yeah. of it. And what we did see was absolutely sublime. Yeah, it is. And the, the people are incredible. Right. And the way I understand traveling um, Canada is you have to have some kind of flotation device, a kayak or a, a canoe or whatever, because, I mean, in the old days with the trappers, sure. there's routes and roads where you can travel, but much everything else you access by water. Interesting. Right. And I've got a, a friend, uh, James Raffin. He's a member of the Explorers Club, um, as am I. And uh, he was, I think, Canada's Explorer of the Year okay. in 2021. A wonderful man, uh, serious, a professional. He's a writer. He's been writing since the eighties. Um, avid explorer, fantastic, mm. fantastic guy. And he was, he was, he's been. I've been talking to him a lot about Canada, and he's like, "That's the way to go. You got to get on the water. That's where you're going to see all these things." Okay. Um, so yeah, I think that'll add an element to it as well. Maybe not in the dead of winter, right? <laughs> <laughs> but there's so much to see and do in, in this beautiful planet. Well, even um, things like doing dog sledding is incredible. I mean, if you, especially if you can find a place where they take really good care of the dogs and they, you know, they're treated properly. So you have to do some research. But um, if you can find the right place and have that experience, it's just incredible. Because you, you guys love dogs, and so do I. And 
to interact with them in that way, in that ancient way, because dogs have been, you know, teaming up with people for a long time. Right. So I don't, I don't think we'd be anywhere near where we're at without our relationship with dogs. Right. It really helped us. And you should see the wolf that I'm traveling with. <laughs> so tell us about your dog. What's the name of your dog? And what, where did where did you find your dog? <clears throat> it was it was it was strange. Um, we've since we started traveling, there's so many stray dogs you see, especially sure. in like Central, your heart. yeah, Central Brace South your. America, Turkey, or such beautiful animals. Yeah, and but we've resisted. Yeah, adopting an animal. Just I just had this like I've got enough on my plates as it is. Yeah, I the know tight where. tight confines and sure, right. right. And um, so I resisted, and the kids and Louisa they would always be like, "Oh, come on!" I'm like, "Not gonna happen. Forget about it." And it's the one thing where I actually had a veto. <laughs> you, know, you got that. you got to pick your one veto, and right, that was it. <laughs> right. I don't have any other power in my family, but that's that's the one thing. And I, it was something clicked in Louisa after the um, after West Africa. We we were taking care of a friend's house. The guy that owns Quick Pitch. Okay, um, sure. Well, Quick Pitch North America, Hein. We were at his house and uh, taking care of it, and they had a bull terrier. Uh, his name was Mo, um, Dayan. Like Moshe Dayan. Okay. Uh, he had a black patch around his sure. eye. And Louisa just fell in love with this dog. And she just started hassling me. <laughs> but it was a campaign. <laughs> right? You were teamed up on by the, the whole and, family. And it, she, I was. Soften you up. Yeah, forget about one it. One goes no. for your kidney. The other right. One go, yeah. Right. And um, we were fixing the Land Rover. The gearbox had broken in, I think, Nigeria, but we got it all the way to South Africa somehow. And uh, we were doing a lot of work on the on the Defender, and every day I'd sit down and I'd light a fire because he had an inbuilt built in like the South Africans do a built in mm. fireplace where you actually cook meat, sure, a bry in uh, a built in bry we call it. And uh, so I'd sit down, light the fire, and I'd crack, crack a cold one, and she'd wait until I got to the second cold one, and then she'd start with, you know, we should really get a dog. <laughs> you know, it, it'll be good for Jessica. Um, you know, she's Keelan's going to leave, and she's going to be lonely, and <laughs> And and she's you know and she just started and I was like forget about it, and uh, two days later she'd do the same thing. And <laughs> this carried on for like three or four months, <laughs> relentless. She did the. She's very focused. She she's is very focused. Laser focused. <laughs> and eventually I gave in and I said, okay, well, well, what are we looking at here? And she said, well, just get a little dog, right? You won't even know he's there, <sighs> and uh, yeah, just adopt a little dog. I was like, okay, you know, let's, how bad could it possibly be, yeah. right? And uh, next thing I know, we we're taking this little rat, doggy thing. <laughs> uh, he was covered with dreadlocks. He'd been oh. on the road for two months. Uh, poor guy. Uh, yeah, it was a Yorkshire Terrier. Okay. It, it didn't look like those other Yorkshire Terriers. <laughs> it looked like, you know, this just little zombie beast. <laughs> and um, he turned out to be absolutely insane. Yeah. Right? Because he'd been on the road on his own. Sure. And I think the reason, because they were hunting dogs. Sure. They, they were bred to run, ra hunt rats and that. Sure. And I was like, yeah, okay. And I didn't take the dog seriously until we were at a friend's house and there was a huge rat running around and this little thing took it. It broke its spine and threw it in the air. And I'm like, what? It's a real dog. <laughs> it's a, re <laughs> it's it's a, a real, real dog. dog. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, yeah, ever since then, it's just been, and it's been so really, really, really good for the family. And now he's your buddy. Yeah, he's my buddy. I love it. He's my number one buddy. I know. Yeah, I They're so buddy. wonderful. When I, whenever we, slow, we drive, we've got this routine. As soon as I slow down, he runs up, boop, and he'll stand on my arm and he'll look around, <laughs> what's going on? He, he attacks people. Um, he doesn't attack people wearing uniforms. Oh, interesting. Uh, That's like, a good thing. <laughs> right, yeah, like police and military uniforms. You won't attack them. But if you work over, walk over wearing a work uniform, like with black boots and, and blue trousers, he'll, he'll attack you. <laughs> so we're just thinking, so he's been through all around Southern Africa up to East Africa. He's traveled with us the whole time now. And he, uh, there was a home invader in South Africa. A guy walked in to the house. He chased him out. Wow. Yeah, that little dog chased this guy out of the house. Um, could have saved my kids. We weren't there. Sure. Because, uh, you know, the situation yeah. in South Africa. Um, he attacked a snake in Mexico. He'll hike 20 Ks and like still want more. So yeah, he's, and, and for the whole thing, he's forced us to be more energetic. Yeah. You have to walk him every day. You have to walk him three times a day. Sure. Um, he, he breaks our focus when we get negative, especially Louisa when she's getting a little bit down in the dumps. I just pass him over and, yeah. and the day <laughs> Emotional just Emotional support. Exactly, yeah. exactly. We all so, need that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so yeah, he's been really good for the family.
I can see it in you right yeah. now. You're pretty excited about your little guy. I What's his name? My dog, Chewbacca. Chewbacca. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's great. Uh, but it, Chewbacca. It, great size for traveling. Doesn't shed. Um, yeah. And once you're around, the, yeah, so I, again, so I, I'd always thought it was a negative <clears throat> traveling with an animal. I thought it was a really bad idea. And I, I still think a Great Dane is too big. Mm, yeah, and sure. I've, I've met a German couple in Morocco with a truck and a three year old and a Great Dane. Mm. Like, what do you think? Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, they, they can actually they add a lot to the journey. Well, I think about I think about Benji in his defense, you right. know, and the fact that he finally found the right pup in Central America somewhere. I think he was at, yeah, that was great. Yeah, or somewhere in Mexico, maybe is where he found him. And then right. I, the the next time I saw him, we were walking through Hyde Park in London, and he's got his same pup, and yeah, just changes his life right. for the positive. I think. Right, and I think I think that's yeah for some people it won't work. Yeah, but I think for us, and as well now the kids are getting ready to leave, mm. right? So when Keelan's gone, when Jessica's moved out, yeah, then it's going to be empty nest syndrome. Yeah, sure. So it'll be good for all of us, I think. I think so. Yeah, no, that sounds right. So, how long have you guys been traveling? When did when? What year did you leave South Africa? We're we're out of here. Well, twenty ten was our first major international. Okay. Trip up to Kenya, to the border, Kenyan border. Uh, and then we came back from that and, and we were just bitten. So now you're, now you're 12 years in, just a little bit over. Right. And looking back on that and what we're finding with the overland industry is that there's so many new, new people coming in that want to travel. Remote work has now allowed people to hit the road and things like Starlink are changing the entire experience, um, even for myself. So these technologies and these capabilities that we have now. So there's all these new people coming into overlanding and there's all these new families as well. Uh, what, what would be a couple of pieces of advice that you would give to that family that's, they're driving right now in their family SUV and they're listening to this podcast um, and they're thinking about how do we give our kids those kinds of experiences? How do we spend that much time like the Bells with our children? What's some, what's some advice that you would give them when they're sitting there driving down the road? Lead from the front, mm. right? As a father, as a mother, we, we set the example, mm. right? We, t your children are a reflection of who you are. You know, most of us, we can put on a, an act in front of other people. If you really want to know what someone's like, speak to his kids, yeah. right? And you get a really clear idea of how things are going in that home, you know, you know what the situation is. Um, and it's been very, very important for me to keep the children, keep, to keep them motivated, to keep them happy. And, and, and happy isn't just as, it's, I think satisfaction is a lot more important than happiness. Sure. Yeah. Uh, happiness is- Challenged and right. motivated. Right, yeah. and loved. Yeah. Encouraged. Um, well, I we, think that's all they really need. Right. I think kids need to feel supported and loved if they've got that kind of take on the world, can't they? Right. And so when people, oh, I'm going to travel with my kids and I need to just take this stuff with you. No, you don't. Yeah. Right? Boys like Lego. <laughs> my girls like Lego. Everyone likes Lego. Yeah. A little bit of Lego. Um, coloring in books. Um, a scrapbook where they can tell their own story. Collect sure. little uh, memories uh, from the road. Sure. Uh, that's, I think those, those are the important things. It's, it's having conversations. Yeah. Taking a walk together. Yeah. Just one on one. Yeah. And just talking about and, and it's a great sounding board because you get to talk about what you want to talk about, how you're feeling sure. and the challenges you're facing. So they understand what's going on in your life. Sure. But then you can speak to them as well and you can like know what's driving them and how they're feeling. And and, and I think that's the communication and respect is very, very important. We've got I see that. I see how you respect your kids, how you talk to Keelan. You talk to him like, you know, a fellow traveler. Right. Like a like an uh, like another man in the home, so, and he's earned it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you know, we. I mean, it's weird when we get into a, a normal environment like a house and and with all the comforts and stuff, we can get a little bit nitpicky with each other. <laughs> sure. Right, but when the dwang hits the fan, we're there together and we take care of it. And I think I told you a story before. We had a breakdown in the middle of the Congo. Yeah. It was a Sunday. There were a lot of drunk people around. We had a Japanese hitchhiker in the back seat. Jessica had malaria, and. Um, Luisa and I got the tools out, got stuck in, fixed the engine, 
Uh, we made sure the kids were settled in or whatever. We, you know, we got stuck in, fixed the problem, came out. Kilian had the fire going and made us some food. We sat on the jerry cans, hold, had a cold beer together. And, you know, no one was touchy with it. It's not, it's not your fault. Don't do this. Don't get upset with each other. It's when, when, when you need to, you pull together. Yeah. You work together and you respect each other. Sure. So I think that would be um, my advice to parents. This is, mm. um, you're going to be spending a lot of time with your kids. And you want to you want to get to understand them, mm. you want to appreciate them, respect them, give them the opportunity to have their own voice, and get involved with 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 them. Mm. But what's really going on in their lives, and it's and it's just a gift that keeps on giving. And and what has Keelan and Jessica taught you? Keelan has taught me. Okay, Jessica's taught me to never eat when she's talking. <laughs> okay, okay. Because she's got the most wicked sense of humor. <laughs> that is, the food ends up exactly, everywhere. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Okay, I like that. i got to be so careful around her because she's wicked. She'll say the funniest things. Um, and, and she's just, she's patient. Yeah. She's loving. She's kind. Yeah. I mean, she, you couldn't find a kinder soul in your life. Um, Good person to travel with. Absolutely. Yeah. Compassionate. Right, so everyone has their days. Right? Sure, um, teenage girls. Yeah, yeah. But when when I'm having a tough time, I know she's going to say, "Dad, chill, you'll be okay. We're going to get through this." You know, so, you know. So I I really kind of lean on her. Sure. In that way, and we have great conversations, and we listen to music together. And she's taught me how to use um, Instagram, <laughs> and and to do that doom scrolling, and we send each other <laughs> puppy videos and stuff like that. I, we were, I don't know where we were having a conversation and she was like, my best friend is a hairy old man. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. That would be me. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> um, so th- she's, she's wonderful in that way. And then Keelan is just, he's got the brain of an engineer, right? And he's just always learning new things. Yeah. Dissecting things, even if it's just mentally. Mm. Um, and he's, he's, he's really passionate about what he cares about. And so we'll have these long conversations about tech sure right where he'll do this deep dive into you know the history of apple and why he despises apple and, <laughs> and uh he's writing me a 10-page dissertation on why elon musk is not the savior of humanity <laughs> and uh and, you know we we always we talk about gaming and and in the beginning i used to think gaming was a bad thing Mm. right because in south america there were so many kids and they were always playing and making friends we got into the u.s there was a lot of internet but not a lot of kids yeah sure and then he got into gaming and then at first i really pushed against that is that you know usual dad kind of thing he's like sitting on your ass not doing anything right but then i realized that he had built a community of people online and if you look at kids they were going to sit around looking at their phones anyway right yep he had this community online and he was playing games like war thunder where they use ancient tanks, all types of tanks. And he would sit me down and say, Dad, did you know that the, the tracks on this tank were actually designed by this guy and the government hated him because he was just such a you know, really difficult person to work with, but eventually they accepted the design and blah, blah, blah. So he teaches me a lot of a lot of things about I, all kinds of uh, works of life, that, to things that I wouldn't naturally be interested sure. in, but he is. And they do, they do talk about, because so many of these games are – are very, you know, they're very advanced. They have a lot of, of complex interac- interaction. So there's a lot of game theory that can apply to life if you play it right. So, cause you know, the game of life can often reflect the same things. I've never, I've never done a lot of that myself. I, I prefer to feel the salt spray and the, and the dust than to see it on a screen. But I certainly understand why someone might want to experience those things virtually. But I think that there's the, a lot can be learned from those, that game theory. Right, and we'd spend a lot of time speaking about the future. Yeah. Because it's very interesting to me, and it's very interesting to him. And there's there's so much going on now in mm. the world. And Rapidly. we're looking, I mean, even our world of overlanding, it's changing. Yeah. Um, you look like very the, quickly. The EVs, et cetera. I mean, yeah. the, the whole landscape's going to change quite quickly. Before we know it. Yeah. And I remember writing an article, is this the golden age of overland travel? Because I'm not quite sure. Well, what is the future going to be like? Um, and... I'm very optimistic. Yes, so, so am I. So I think it's just going to keep getting better. Yes, so am I. And we'll, uh, learn, we'll learn as we go along. Yeah, for sure. And so, so Keelan and I were always having these, these, these debates about the future, about developments, about AI, mm. about things like gaming, about um, virtual reality. Sure. And so he, up, he sends me these, oh man, they're always too long, but he sends me all these videos that uh, they challenge my, my 
preconceptions or my opinions. Sure. And and then we'd sit and then we'd talk about it and then we'd listen to podcasts about privacy and all that kind of stuff. Fascinating. So yeah, I, yeah, I can carry on for hours about it, but I won't. But yeah. He, but isn't that, isn't that, what a gift. You're right. Graham, I mean, right. to have those conversations with your son. Right. And I'm going to miss them. Yeah. When he's sure. gone, because I'm yeah. going to be listening to the girls carry on about their things. <laughs> and it's not going to be the, the level It'll of conversation. It'll be a little different. Yeah. yeah it's going to be, be, but it's, it's still going to be good. But um, yeah, I think we learned so much from the kids and they've enriched our lives and they've made us better people. Sure. Right. So one of the things that I love to ask is any, well, I'm going to ask you two questions. So we always ask, what new book that you've been reading that you love, but we also have to talk about your new book. So let's first go any, anything that you've been reading over the last couple of years that you think our audience would, would love to pick up and, and take a look at themselves. Any, any subject at all. It can be even, even something that Keeland has recommended to you, but what book have you really loved recently? Uh, the most recent, most enjoyable book, book I was, I was sitting in, on the beach near Loretto with a friend of mine that I, um, James and Lauren, they're mm. home on the highway. I think they call themselves. And we've, we've had a braai on, or a barbecue on three or four continents. And I was hanging out with him, and we were right by the Sea of Cortez. And I was like, hey, man, did you, did you hear that story about that fisherman who got swept out to sea? And he's like, yeah, 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 I just got the book today. I was like, well, that's a coincidence. Isn't that interesting? So anyway, a uh, couple of weeks later, we met up again up in the mountains. And... Um, he gave me the book, 438 Days, it's called. And this guy, yeah, it's a very interesting story. I got swept out to sea. And, and it's too interesting to me because I'm interested in survival. And I'm, we, sure. we go into a lot of very remote places. And You've had to survive. Right. And yeah. we've had a lot of situations where our water filters are essential. Sure. Um, and we've got to have contingency plans. And we think, well, what, well, if, you know, we've been in a lot of places where it could have been dangerous. So sure. survival to me is just an interesting topic and it's, it's relevant to my life. Sure. And then this guy survived 438 days on a boat. Uh, so that was a very, very good read. Um, there's also James Raffin. I've read a, a few of his books. You just look him up and he's got some great – there's one I, I'm struggling to remember the title right now because my mind is terrible. But uh, it was about a tragedy back in the day mm. where uh, there was a school that had a very um, interesting concept of, of, of using discipline and, and extreme sports as part of education, making boys into men. Sure. Um, and they had a, a, a tragedy on a, a lake in um, back in the 80s, 70s, okay. 80s. They, they took all these kids. They used to make them go snowshoeing and doing marathon snowshoeing, little kids. Um, and anyway, they went out uh, on this on this lake and it was the wrong time to do it. And the storm came up and 13 kids, I think, died. Oh, wow. And James goes back and he dissects that entire story. So it's very, very interesting as well. That would be interesting. Yeah. So now let's talk about your new book. Right. So uh, the new book is a second edition of Travel the Planet Overland. Which is fantastic. All right. Thank you very much. That was basically everything we know about overland travel. And the first edition came out. We'd been on the road. I mean, we did a lot of overlanding back in South Africa, but I think it was after uh, five years of full-time overland travel with kids, circumnavigating South America, or Eastern, Southern Africa, etc. So we had a lot of experience. We had a lot to share. And we, we don't presume that we know it all. Yeah, sure. Right? I don't want to come impossible. across. Exactly. It's impossible. Exactly. impossible. Exactly. And, and, I, and sometimes you read these articles and these guys are coming across as okay. if. And I would, that I'd just never, means they haven't been anywhere. <laughs> right. And I wouldn't describe myself as an expert, mm -hmm. but I would ex describe us as being experienced. Sure. And I think that's, that's and that come, comes across in the writing. I've always felt that the term expert needs to be given to someone else, not said about yourself. Right. Anybody who calls himself an expert, I'm usually pretty suspicious. Right. So. And, I, and, and, it's, and I, it's a title I'd be reluctant to accept. For sure. All right. Even though I may be. It's but, deservingly for you, for sure. Yeah. But at the same time, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm always learning. Sure. Always learning. And, and, and this is the thing. So the second edition, it hasn't. The core of the book hasn't changed that much, but it's basically been a rewrite mm. because we've learned so much. And reading it again, I was like, okay, I was spot on with that. Um, and, but I've got new experience with this. And so I, I, we could have just regurgitated. Can you, give, can you give an example of something where you're, you've changed your mind or it's, you've been surprised that you now have a different approach? I think the, um, the full-size rig okay. would definitely be. That would be one of mine for sure. Right. Yeah. Right. And it's, and, and, Okay, well, speaking about that, it's like going from the 
from a defender, people, I remember when, I, when we started using the number one, people were like, oh, you're getting soft. <laughs> you're getting soft. And I was like, um, didn't I just spend six months in a freaking Range Rover driving, <laughs> like sleeping in swamps and I stuff? Yeah. Um, no, they say haters are going to hate, right? <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> but the, the point is more that I realized that the, the capability and the luxury, relative luxury of that vehicle, I, I ripped out the microwave and I'm not going to use stuff that's superfluous. But when you have a good night's sleep, when you are have less to worry about on the road, when you're capable off-road, yeah. you've got more energy and time to yeah. think about destination, to think about experience, to think about... And there's no award for suffering. I mean, it's right. like you don't, you don't like win like the gold medal for suffering. Like, <laughs> like that's something that is unfortunate that happens to you. Right, it's right. not something that you have to do in order to win someone's respect. I think that be, getting a full night's rest and being able to to like absorb more of your experiences and and like maybe have a heater when it's cold out right. there's nothing wrong with that it, it but it it creates opportunities sure because now you know you've had a rough day it's dusty it's dirty or whatever you know what? okay we're going to use a little bit of water and have a shower yeah right um man it just your whole day just gets so much better it's incredible right yeah. And then yeah, the next day you're ready for it. Yeah, for sure. As, in, as opposed to going to sleep covered in dirt and grease or whatever. Yeah, sure. Um, so that was very interesting to me. I, st I, I don't think I could be convinced that the big trucks is the way to go. Yeah, sure. The next step up. Right. Yeah. I, I don't think you, I'll be coming out with the, the next edition in five years' time and saying, you know, I was, right, I was wrong about Unimogs. <laughs> um, but I, I think, yeah, so the big rigs, you know, you've got space capability, all of that – I think which the trucks offer, but without all of those downsides. Sure. So it's a great compromise. So there, I think that's one thing that I realized I was wrong about. Um, other than that, I'm a genius. There's nothing wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, they'll have to read the book to find out what the differences are. <laughs> I'm trying to think. There's a lot of words. Um, so totally rewrote it. It was supposed to be out. The book was supposed to be out a little while ago, but we weren't happy until it was right. Sure. And I mentioned James Raffin again and, and – uh, he said, oh, send me the, the draft. Sure. I sent it to him, 340 pages. And he, he edited the entire thing. For me. Wow. Yeah. And what I a was, gift. Yeah. And I was, I was like, I wasn't expecting that. Um, so then we did the revisions based on that, and uh, which I think is going to mean it's going to be a, a higher quality. Nice. The, the, yeah, the quality of the book, the, you, know, you know, it's quirky. My books are always a little bit eccentric. Yeah, but I, I love those little stories at the back of it of the other travelers. And I, mean, I just think it's just, it's a very enjoyable read. It's, I think it's so easy to just do this, try to do this a academic approach of how I see someone mm -hmm. should overland. Whereas you're like, this is what worked for me. This is what didn't work for me. Yeah. Here's and the I think story. that's a lot more honest. Yeah. Here's the story of uh, why you shouldn't do what I did. Mm. Right. And this is, or yeah. So there's, a, there's a lot of that kind of stuff. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, Basically, we wrote the book. A lot of the good stuff is in there. A little bit of the format has been changed. All new images, new cover. Uh, the design, the layout is going to be beautiful. So, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were excited about it. I'm, I'm glad it's done. And how do people find <coughs> find the book? Uh, basically, I think the best way to do it is go through our website. Okay. Um, and, yeah, pretty much. It'll and be is it, your website is still A2A? Or what, what's, what's the, what is the current website that you guys are sending people to? It's a 2 expeditioncom Okay, it's got a it. number two a expeditioncom Okay, got it. Uh, for now, it'll probably be listed on Amazon. Okay. Uh, we did do a Kickstarter for it, so there's 300, 400 copies going out straight out the door. Sure. Uh, but then after that, it'll be available on through our website and on Amazon. But it's obviously a lot better if people buy the book from us. Sure. Because then we make yeah, the you profit get instead of Jeff. Right? For sure. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He he can go to. Mars, you're just trying to make it to Siberia. So <laughs> if he doesn't mind, <laughs> yeah, that's okay for sure. Exactly. Yeah. And then uh, the last thing that we like to ask, and you did give an answer the last time, which you may or not rem remember, but I'd love to see what the new answer is uh, for someone that's new to overlanding and they want to go see the world. What's, what's the, the elevator pitch. You got 30 seconds to give them some advice. What would you say? Use what you have. The car that you've got sitting in your driveway, it'll do it. Yeah. You could do a Cape Town to Cairo in a, uh, a Mini Cooper. An you old could Mini do Cooper. Chavo, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> you could do South America. Yeah. Um, it's not about the vehicle. It's not about the gear. It's about the mindset. Mm. It's about 
getting out there and doing it and being adventurous and being respectful yeah. and and opening yourself up to new um, experiences. Allow yourself to be changed a little bit. Right, right. Yeah. And uh, yeah, be be adventurous. Be 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 the kind of person you think you should be and treat yeah. people. Uh, the way you would like to be treated, yeah. but yeah, essentially the golden rule. How about right, that? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, the, the greatest obstacle I think for most people is what's inside their own heads, mm. what's holding them back. Um, and start small, go bigger. You don't have to be the world's greatest overlander in the first week because you're not going to achieve that anyway. Yeah. It takes years and years and years. And even us old veterans, we're still learning all the time. Always, right? So yeah, that would be my advice. Oh, I appreciate that, Graham. It's right. it's always such a pleasure to spend time with you. Right. I look up to you so much in your family. You guys have done wonderful adventure, adventures around the world as a family, uh, which has encouraged so many people to do that. And we appreciate all of the content that you provide to Overland Journal and Expedition Portal. It makes such a difference for us and for our readers and listeners. So thanks for being in Prescott, and thanks for going to the Overland Expo and people are going to be able to read a bunch of new content from you soon. Right. So. Yeah, there's a bunch of good stories coming this way. Yeah, no doubt. All right, Graham, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you very much. Yeah, and thank you, Scott, for the opportunity. You know, I, when, uh, I think when we met, first met you years ago, yeah, uh, we, were, we were struggling through it, man. We were, uh, the first book had come out, I'd like, Louisa, we can do this, we're going to make it. And I think a major turning point for us in our entire journey was when we started writing for Expedition Portal. Thank you. And where we got that first Overland Journal article. And it gave us the confidence mm-hmm. and it gave us an income. Sure. Um, and it really has been a very, very important part of our journey. Well, we're, we're both helping each other out. It's amazing. Yeah. Isn't that what it's supposed to be? Right. Well, thank you, Graham. And we thank you all for listening. And we'll talk to you next time.